Hello, everyone. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Platwoods Church. Welcome to all of you gathered here in this space, and a special hello to those of you worshiping with us online this morning. Today, we are starting this new sermon series called Take Care. This is one of those phrases embedded into our vernacular that we use often, almost without thinking. Ironically, we are careless with this phrase. You're parting ways with a friend after dinner, take care till we meet again. You're ending a phone conversation with a person you like a lot but aren't in an I love you sort of situation, take care. Maybe you sign off from an email with it. We use it with purpose, but we don't think about the meaning too much. I love the way comedian Brian Regan, anyone familiar with Brian Regan's work? Hilarious. I love the way he demonstrates our unconscious mind at work in using phrases like this one. He does this in his stand-up routines, but it made it into a movie concessions commercial too. Just check it out, it's fun. Yeah, can I get a large Coke and a popcorn, please? Sure, no problem. I heard this movie is a real tearjerker with a great goodbye scene. I love that. I love goodbye scenes because they're always so smooth when they do them. Whereas in real life, I always get flustered. Like the other day, these people were leaving, and I started to say, take care, which would have been fine until this part of my brain got involved. Say good luck instead. Yeah, but I'm, I don't care. You know, so it came out like this weird hybrid. See you later, Brian. Take luck. Thanks. Take luck and care. Take care of the luck. Good luck taking care of the luck that you might have. When you have luck, take it and care for it. You take all care of the luck when you I'm have... Popcorn. Oh, okay. I was just saying that that's how I say it, not smooth. (laughs) It's like old Brian Regan. I mean, it's young Brian Regan, but it's old. I wanted to call the series Take Luck instead, but that really wouldn't have made any sense, so we didn't do that. But all of that to say, take care is a common phrase that we use without thinking. But when we do stop to think about it, it holds a lot of meaning and purpose for us. Our God is a God who cares for us, and we are made as creatures with the capacity to care as well. That capacity, though, is often challenged by the individualistic culture we are a part of. And yet God has created us with enormous potential to be gentle and kind, to consider things and people outside of ourselves, to recognize the impact we have all around us, We are entrusted to care for the many gifts God has given us, and I hope that this series will help us remember our responsibility to take care of the things most important in our lives. Over these next four weeks, we'll explore what it means to more intentionally take care, to take care of others, our relationships and our community, to take care of our resources, our money and our possessions, to take care of creation, our environment and ecosystems, and to take care of ourselves. As we were crafting this series, I couldn't help but think of the last three years of human history and the collective trauma that we have endured. When we compile a global pandemic, wars in multiple places, political dramas and dysfunction playing out on stages around the world, climate change and its increasingly damaging effects on our current way of life, that's a lot for humans to process. Any one of those things alone is enough to make us want to shut down and quit functioning altogether. And yet, somehow, here we still are. But if I might make a broad general observation about human behavior in such a time as this, what I notice is that we collectively did what all humans do when facing a threat or trauma. We do whatever we have to do to survive. You might be familiar with the standard fight or flight responses. Mental health specialists these days will actually name four F responses to trauma. There's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And they all look like quite different. They all look quite different as responses, but they are all born out of this innate need to self-preserve, to protect one's very life and the well-being of those closest to us. Basically, I feel like I've been in mama bear mode for three solid years now. (laughs) We all have. 
Eight billion creatures existing together, either fighting, fleeing, freezing, or fawning. It's exhausting, and it's taking its toll on us. As a result, I observe, as an armchair sociologist, that we've become more isolated and introverted as a society. We have been focused on ourselves and our dependents because that's all we have the capacity to think about in survival mode. Remember the toilet paper debacle? <laughs> what better metaphor than that to represent the state of human relationships in this present era? As for me and my house, we will have toilet paper. Good luck to the rest of you. I remember the panic of adapting to at-home learning with a preschooler and a second grader while trying to work a full-time job for a church that was now entirely virtual. Our family had resources. We figured out how to make it work. We found our household solution, and we wished the same for everyone else, but we didn't go out of our way to help anyone try to achieve it. I remember the desperation to get vaccines. The people who could, traveling hours away to get the doses that were available. The relief that came when our entire household had our shots and not really having to worry too much more about those who didn't. These seem like small incidents now. They're just memories. But at the time they happened, they were all consuming. When you feel like everything about your way of life is threatened, you focus all your efforts on protecting your bubble. We even called them bubbles, remember? And that ongoing posture of desperate protection over long periods of time, longer than the last three years even, that posture of protection is why we have more guns than humans in the United States. It's why we can't find bipartisan solutions at our borders. It's why we have stand your ground laws. It's why ring doorbells are so wildly popular now. It's why no one carpools to school anymore, everyone drives their own kid. It's why anxiety and depression in young people and everyone really is running rampant. We have been traumatized. And so we look out for ourselves and our own. It is possible that on the whole, human beings are forgetting how to care. There's an interesting but little known word that I've seen crop up more and more frequently in recent years. Anyone ever heard the word acedia? It's best known as one of the seven deadly sins in Christian tradition. And we usually hear it listed as sloth, which we associate more with laziness. But the word comes from Greek, and it's not really about laziness. It actually means uh, the prefix a is a negative prefix, so a without, and kados, care, acedia without care. It's better recognized as apathy, simply not caring. This is not what we were made for. And don't hear me saying that I think you all individually are apathetic and self-centered and stuck in fight or flight. I'm speaking sociologically, trying to say that I think the, the world as a whole is stuck in this survival inertia, and so therefore we are affected by it too, and I'm saying that we are made for more. We are made to take care. Is it possible that we can begin to claw our way back to a communal life of loving God and loving others, and in doing so, remind the rest of the world what humans were really made for? The other night, I watched a Netflix movie with Paul Rudd and Selena Gomez. It was called The Fundamentals of Caring. I recommend it to you. It's absolutely beautiful movie, maybe not as suited for younger audiences, so parents take note. But it's about a middle-aged man who becomes a caregiver for a teenager with muscular dystrophy. And in the training that Rudd's character receives, the instructor drills down on the fundamentals of caregiving over and over again, which are represented with the acronym ALOHA. Ask, listen, observe, help, ask again. And while that may be a good starting point for good caregiving, and maybe many of us need to write that down and put it someplace to remember every day, the whole point of the rest of the movie is that real care goes far beyond those fundamentals. When I think of what real caring looks like, there are people right here in our congregation who give us the blueprint. People who are not by choice, but by circumstance caring 
for a loved one, a spouse or a partner whose health is declining steadily, a child born with special needs, a grandchild embraced as their parent works through their own challenges, a lover whose memory fades even as the days do. You all in those circumstances know something of care that the rest of us do not. So when we want to begin to stretch outside of ourselves and intentionally care for others, we might look to these ordinary saints among us for the fundamentals of caring. Some lessons we might observe from them is that caring for others is a daily commitment. It is measured and offered in the littlest of things. It is also more than an action, it is disposition, and ultimately it comes from a deep reservoir within the caregiver. When we talk about daily commitment, there is no opt-out day. There is a perseverance and a willingness to wake up and turn toward the other who is in need of care. Even on the days that we don't want to care, care is still needed and so care is given. And that what ma that's what makes care more than an action, but actually a disposition. It's a posture that is naturally, instinctively turned, not inward toward the self, but outward toward another. It's a frame of mind that is rewired to think first of another person and be fully aware of their experience in the moment to understand and to anticipate what it is that will make them comfortable, what will alleviate their pain, that what will give them a sense of security and love so one's heart begins to live outside of oneself instead of inside. And it's not the grand gestures or the major sacrifices that communicate this depth of care, it's the consistency and the persistence of the little things. You've heard of death by a thousand paper cuts, this is the opposite of that. This is life by a thousand Band-Aids. <laughs> Tending to the little things of every moment that need attention and often healing, the combing of hair, the dosing of meds, the trimming of fingernails, the finding of misplaced things. And the repetition and the constancy of all these little things is only sustained by some miraculously deep reservoir that these caring souls have cultivated within themselves. They draw their strength from a primal, divine love deep within them to fully embrace the other in their life who needs their perpetual care. Those who best teach us to care are those who live both fully grounded in themselves and fully surrounding someone else at the same time. Our scriptures, of course, also give us plenty of advice and instruction on how to care for others. Nearly every epistle, which is a letter written in the New Testament, in the latter half of our New Testament, is written with the purpose of instructing a faith community, an early church, a new church, in how to behave toward one another, how to treat people, how to interact with their church, but also how to care for the people outside of it. We could read any one of the epistles, any one of those books in the Bible, and get very similar prescriptions for what a caring church looks like. I'm picking up a few verses from 1 Thessalonians as our sample today because this was likely the first letter that Paul wrote and so we might consider his advice a template because we see it over and over again in his other letters. And I think his suggestions are about as straightforward as we can get. So these are Paul's final instructions at the end of his letter to the church at Thessalonica. So encouraging each other and building each other up just like you are doing already, live in peace with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. He goes on after this with an even longer list that includes prayer and rejoicing and giving thanks. But just those first two verses alone give us plenty to start with as we consider how we take care of others. Encourage one another. Live in peace. Warn the disorderly. Comfort the discouraged. Help the weak. Be patient. Just look over that list for a moment. We're going to leave it up there for a minute. 
Which one of these jumps out at you today? If you could take one step toward or one step further in taking care of others, which one of these would you commit to? Could you practice it today? Pick one, pick two if you're ambitious, but really commit to one, just right now in this moment. Write it down, take a picture of it on the screen if you want to. Try it with your kid, with your spouse, with a neighbor, with a coworker, with someone in whatever group you're a part of here at the church, someone sitting next to you if you feel so inclined. Now you can't all pick warn the disorderly. I know a lot of you did. <laughs> Settle down. What's interesting about that one is that the word for disorderly is translated a few different ways into English. One way, meaning disruptive to the life of faith, this community at Thessalonica was trying to establish. Who wasn't bought in? Who was rocking the boat? Another way it's translated has to do with being slack, not pulling their weight, loafing around and letting others do all the work in the church community. So just take that under consideration if that's the one you picked. You can't just go around warning whoever you please. There's criteria here. But make your pick. Encourage, help, comfort, be patient, and try it out. Paul tells the church to do all this good together with and for one another. He said, make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other. Ultimately, this is what makes the church the church, sets it apart from whatever world it's in, whether it's the Roman Empire, Greek religious cults, the feudal system of Middle Age Europe, the remote regions of sub-Saharan Africa, the northern suburbs of Kansas City, Missouri, wherever the church is, how we care for one another should be something that people notice from the outside. But then, Paul goes one step further. He's been so very specific to this community at Thessalonica and very particular about how they care for one another in their life of faith together. And then he just sort of throws this on the end of the sentence, like an afterthought that's really bigger than the whole of everything else that he said. And everyone else. Pursue the good for each other, and while you're at it, the whole world too. Taking care of others is clearly an individual and interior responsibility for us as Christians to take on. But with a simple, sweeping statement, Paul reminds us it is a communal responsibility, too. All of us together are charged with taking care of everyone else. We are asked to encourage everyone else. We are told to be patient with everyone else, help everyone else, comfort everyone else, live in peace with... You got there. If we ever get all of this right in here, in our connected community, that's still not enough. Our taking care has to leak out. We hold the fundamentals of caring, and we have to use them with everyone. Because this is how God is toward us. So this month, Aligned with this entire series, we have ways for you to practice caring. Sure, you can do it on your own, in your own personal life, but we have ways for you to practice together as a church community for everyone else. We've called this whole month September Go Serve. So you have the whole month to find a way just to take a step. Just as you're taking a step today in your personal relationships, I want you to take a step with us as a church. This past Tuesday, some of our staff here at Platte Woods dedicated three hours of our morning at Speak Food Pantry in Parkville, just right down the road. We bagged up groceries for seven families, like a ton of groceries for each family. It was incredible. Comforting those who are discouraged. You can do the same any Tuesday this month, or honestly this whole year. We have now committed as a church to Tuesday mornings at Speak Food Pantry. Yesterday, Pastor Chung Ho and Vicky trained almost, no, over 20, 28 care ministers here in our church, people dedicated to visiting the sick, encouraging those who are weary, helping the weak right here in our own church. It's never too late to join that crew. We can always train you. See Pastor Chung Ho or Vicki later today. 
You can sign up to participate in a two-week conversation and tour focusing on redlining in KC if you hadn't figured out what the red line in our foyer was yet. But this is taking the time to care about and understand some of our history, our city's history that's harmful to our black neighbors in generations both past and even present. You can join us for a community cleanup day at the end of the month, the same weekend that we'll be talking about our task of taking care in creation. Scan the QR code, you got it on the card when you came in. You can click on the Serve tab for a whole list of more opportunities, finding ways that we can take care together and sign up there. The same information is also in our Wednesday Word from last week. You'll get another one this Wednesday. You can find that link there. You can always talk to a staff member. We will get you connected with an opportunity that works for you as we exercise our caring muscles once again. Regardless of what you sign up for, what you commit to, what action steps you take in your life this week, let's make this a month of remembering our identity as Christians who are known not by our beliefs, not by our steeple, not by our opinions, or by our theology, or even by our name, but who are known by our love and by how we take care of one another and everyone else. I'll invite you to join with me as I close with a prayer. This prayer is a little longer than the ones I usually close with, and I'm borrowing the words from a brilliant writer, Ted Loder. And this prayer encapsulated for me all of, all of the dichotomy and the mystery and the complexness of caring. So I'll invite you to listen. In long prayers, I'm mindful that your mind can wander and that's okay. But as I go through the complexity of care, if there's a phrase or a word, something that grabs you, that resonates with your heart today, I'll invite you just to grab onto it, hold on to it as we pray together. Holy one, most of the time, you don't seem very close or real to me. Only a word, an ought. A longing, maybe, a hope. And for the most part, I don't care much about you, and that's the not-so-pretty truth of it. But there are things I do care about. Myself, mostly and some people I feel close to, families, friends, children, most of all children, I do care what happens to them. So I, I do care about love, about being loved, and about loving, or trying to. And I wonder about it, how to do it, and what makes me want to do it. With those close to me, I care about laughing, and crying, and learning, and talking honestly, a little, and fighting openly and fairly and forgiving a bit more, and admitting I want to be forgiven and need to be once in a while. I care about things, about getting them and being gotten by them, and I do care about money and all the things I do for it and with it and what it does to me, and I care about being a little freer of all that somehow, because I care about being secure, core deep. I care about my neighbors, at least some of them, sometimes, and about all the things that would make it better and perhaps easier for us to live together and the hard decisions and sacrifices it would take for that to happen, which means I do care about justice, though mostly from a distance, because I care about what it might require of me, and then I get testy or silent, but am haunted by it, because something in me won't let me stop caring about it, even though I often wish I could. So I care about my enemies, and am tired of being angry and suspicious so much, which is such a waste, and, and I care about the least, the hungry, and the sick, and the terrorized, and the exploited of the earth because I care about peace and long for it inside and out. And I'm weary of being afraid for myself and my children. I care about this tiny, fragile, blue planet, this home, this mother earth and all her offspring, 
all the creatures who share the mystery of life. And I really do care about beauty, about the songs in me, the poems, the stories. I care deeply about the wondrous, puzzling, aching struggle that I am. I care about this joy I feel flickering sometimes, flaring sometimes when I touch hands or eyes or minds or sexes or souls and ache then for more. I care about living, living more fully, abundantly, and about my urgent longing for that. I care about what makes me restless, makes me reach and stretch and grope for words, for dreams, for other people, and for you. Holy one, you. I do care about you. Sometimes fiercely, or I wouldn't be stumbling along like this trying to pray, trying to put myself in your way. I care about you. And such is my faith, however faltering it is, and I trust that, past words, you care about all these things that I care about. Care about them more, infinitely more than I care about them. And that you care for me, even when I am careless of the things I care about. Amen.